This video is part two of two. Be sure to check out part one. While crocodilians are some of nature's most deadly predators, like most other reptiles, they are ectothermic, the metabolic condition commonly referred to as cold-blooded. Ectothermic animals are reliant on the external environment to maintain their internal body temperature. As a result of their low metabolism, they are generally less active than endothermic or warm-blooded species, who generate their own body heat. Examples of endotherms include mammals and dinosaurs. Since reptiles are ancestrally ectothermic, and because endothermy is generally seen as more advanced than ectothermy, it was once thought that the prehistoric ancestors of the crocodilians were also cold-blooded. However, crocodilians are actually the descendants of warm-blooded animals who only later reverted back to a low metabolism. Part 1 explained the evidence for this ranging from indicators of the metabolism of the ancestors and relatives of today's crocodilians from their fossils, to vestigial traits related to endothermy in the crocodilians themselves. This video will instead examine how the thermoregulation of crocodilians and their ancestors evolved over time, as well as why crocodilians returned to a seemingly more primitive state. The evolution of crocodilian metabolism through time will be addressed first. While crocodilians may bear a closer outward resemblance to lizards, as the last living dinosaurs, the warm-blooded birds are their closest living relatives. Crocodilians and dinosaurs are part of the clade Archosaura. Archosaura is formed by crocodilians, dinosaurs, and their last common ancestor, as well as a large number of now-extinct reptiles, such as pterosaurs, who are also descendants of that ancestor. Like birds, the first archosaurs also had a high metabolism, though not to the same extent as today's birds. Therefore, while birds have since enhanced it over the years, their high metabolism is inherited from the exact same high metabolism present in the proto-crocodilians. Furthermore, it is clear that the first archosaur wasn't the first endotherm in the lineage that led to today's crocodilians. Archosaura is part of an even larger clade called Archosauromorpha, which consists of all reptiles more closely related to the archosaurs than to any other living reptiles. While these stem archosaurs were ancestrally ectothermic, during the late Permian and early Triassic, the metabolisms of some archosauromorphs, such as Prolacerta, began to increase. While Prolacerta's metabolism was lower than that of most birds and mammals, it was much higher than today's non-avian reptiles. By the beginning of the Triassic period, a clade of clearly warm-blooded archosauromorphs, archosauroformes, started to proliferate. It included the proterosuchids, erythrosuchids, proterochamsids, and the true archosaurs. Many of the archosaurs more closely related to birds would see their metabolisms rise even higher as they evolved. Meanwhile, those more closely related to crocodilians, the pseudosuchians, would never possess metabolisms on par with most modern mammals or birds. Still, Throughout the Triassic period, most Pseudosuchians retained their already high metabolisms. They ranged from large, active predators such as the Rawasuchids, to fleet-footed herbivores like the Shuvosaurids. The first crocodiliomorphs were far from an exception. While the earliest Triassic crocodiliomorphs were large predators, most, such as Terrestriosuchus, were small, agile animals. Even without examining their bone histology, it would have been difficult for them to have carried out their clearly active lifestyles without a high metabolism. These early crocodiliomorphs are also the last members of crocodile-line archosaurs who are confirmed to have still been endothermic. 
Unfortunately, there is a gap between them and the next crocodilian morphs to have been tested. For now, the metabolisms of clades such as Proterosuchidae and Chartagosuchidae remain a mystery. Those who have been tested are part of the clade Metasuchia. Metasuchia evolved during the Jurassic period and consists of two major groups. The Neosuchians, which largely consist of amphibious species, including modern crocodilians, and the diverse terrestrial Nodosuchians. Examination of Nodosuchian bone histology has revealed they were ectothermic. This is surprising as Nodosuchians were previously assumed to have been warm-blooded on account of their upright posture and how many held niches otherwise dominated by endothermic dinosaurs and mammals, including that of large predators. However, the metabolism of Nodosuchians was still not as low as that of crocodilians, being more akin to that of monitor lizards. As the earliest tested Neosuchians were also ectothermic, ectothermy was most likely present in the first Metasuchians, as opposed to being developed independently in Nodusuchians. These two clades are thought to have split off from each other during the early Jurassic period, making this the latest point ectothermy could have reappeared in Crocodiliomorpha. While ectothermic crocodiliomorphs would be the norm for most of the remainder of the Mesozoic era, the more basal, endothermic crocodiliomorphs stuck around at least until the end of the Jurassic period. There is at least one case of ectothermic crocodiliomorphs returning to a higher metabolism. The fully aquatic Metrorhynchids had a metabolism between that of the closely related ectothermic teleosaurids and the other Mesozoic marine reptiles. These reptiles were fully endothermic, even those like the Mosasaurs and Plesiosaurs who were also descended from ectotherms. Therefore, it seems that the Metrorhynchids returned to a higher metabolism for the same reasons as their aquatic contemporaries. Metrorhynchids lasted into the early Cretaceous period, though it is unknown whether or not these Cretaceous species evolved to become fully endothermic, as only Jurassic species have been tested. Either way, by the time of the Cenozoic era, only ectothermic crocodiliomorphs remained. Most of these were either crocodilians or the similarly amphibious dirosaurids. One group of terrestrial Nodosuchians, the Sebekosuchians, also survived and went on to fill the role of large predators in South America for most of the Cenozoic era. Therefore, while there is still some uncertainty about a few details, the basic picture of the evolution of crocodiliomorph metabolism is coming into view. This leaves the question of why the crocodilian's ancestors reverted to a lower metabolism. Reverting to ectothermy may seem odd at first, as endothermy offers a lot of benefits. Endotherms are able to be at their optimal body temperature all the time, which means that chemical reactions in their bodies are always happening at their most optimal rate. In contrast, ectotherms are much more sluggish during the cooler parts of the day. Metabolism doesn't just dictate when an animal can be active, but how active it can be. Ectotherms tire out a lot quicker than endotherms. The ability to generate their own body heat also means endotherms can inhabit areas too cold for ectotherms to even survive. Finally, as mentioned previously, a high metabolism also allows for a much higher growth rate. The while endothermy comes with a lot of advantages, it is not more evolutionarily advanced. If it was, ectotherms would have been replaced hundreds of millions of years ago. A high metabolism requires a lot of energy to maintain, meaning endotherms require a lot more food than ectotherms of comparable size. The benefits of endothermy often outweigh this cost, allowing for the endotherms to acquire even more food. However, this is not the case for every niche, particularly for semi-aquatic ambush predators. 
Crocodilians rely on their prey approaching from the water while they lay submerged and then quickly strike. With larger prey, they then drag them into the water to drown. This requires a lot less energy than more traditional tactics. Additionally, crocodilians also usually do not roam in search of prey, instead waiting for potential victims to approach from the shore. This means a warm-blooded crocodilian would be spending vast amounts of energy while simply sitting and waiting. A cold-blooded metabolism instead allows for crocodilians to waste much less energy between meals. The cost of endothermy would also be much higher for crocodilians than for their ancestors. Water has a higher thermal conductivity than air, meaning the heat generated by an endotherm is lost to the environment quicker. If crocodilians were still endotherms, they would need to either burn a lot more energy for the same benefit, or end up with a much lower body temperature for the same, already high price. Ectotherms also consume oxygen at a much lower rate than endotherms do, allowing them to stay submerged for much longer. This is a very useful trait for a predator that either hunts aquatic prey, or ambushes its meals from the water. Unsurprisingly, most of the other predators that have held the niche of semi-aquatic ambush predator were also ectothermic. However, crocodilians are not the only example that was descended from endotherms. An early archosauriform, Proterosuchus, has been suggested to have led a crocodilian-like lifestyle, though this remains debated. Either way, the metabolism of Proterosuchus was between that of early, endothermic archosauromorphs and true ectotherms. A more concrete example is Phytosaura. Despite their similar appearance, Phytosaurs are among the most distant relatives of crocodilians in Pseudosuchia, with their similarities being the product of a similar lifestyle. While descended from endotherms, Phytosaur bone histology suggests a low metabolism. More detailed examination of the Phytosaur rudiodon found that it was firmly ectothermic. Therefore, it has generally been accepted that crocodilians also reverted to ectothermy in response to evolving their amphibious lifestyle. However, as mentioned before, recent examination of the bone histology of Nodusukians has shown crocodiliomorphs had already evolved a low metabolism earlier in their evolution. Therefore, while an ectothermic metabolism is critical for the niche of the crocodilians of today, it was not the original reason ectothermy evolved in the crocodilian lineage. Still, seeing as Nodusukians did have a higher metabolism than most other ectotherms, it seems the semi-aquatic habits of the Neosukians pressured them to evolve an even lower metabolism. Still, this leaves an important question unanswered. Why did the terrestrial ancestors of the Neosukians and Nodusukians evolve a low metabolism in the first place? Hopefully, future research of the crocodiliomorphs between the basal and more derived clades will help to answer this. Either way, the fact that the prehistoric ancestors of today's crocodilians were endotherms has not only important implications for how we perceive those ancestors, but also the crocodilians of today. A common myth about crocodilians is that they are living fossils, practically unchanged from their ancestors. Whereas birds are considered highly divergent from the early archosaurs, crocodilians are often used to fill in the gaps in our knowledge of Triassic archosaurs and their relatives. Though the earliest, true crocodilians were living lifestyles similar to most of those alive today, and not too different from many other preceding Neosuchians, Crocodilians are very poor representatives of their warm-blooded ancestors and other relatives from the Triassic period. Their unusually low metabolism is merely one of the more dramatic examples. Whereas birds evolved in even higher metabolism, crocodilians evolved in the opposite direction, 
While birds took to the air, crocodilians took to the water, though some birds would later follow them there. The highly derived nature of both birds and crocodilians is important to keep in mind when trying to understand the nature of the early archosaurs. The revelation of an ancestrally high metabolism has certainly helped Triassic archosaurs be seen as the generally active animals they were rather than simply as the sluggish predecessors to the dinosaurs. Even for ancestrally cold-blooded species, the crocodilians' return to ectothermy helps show ectotherms are not inferior to birds or mammals, but are merely using a different strategy that still works for them. And for the crocodilians themselves, it shows their evolution was much more dynamic and innovative than they are often unfairly given credit for. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something interesting. I am glad to have finally made these two videos, having first gotten the idea for them over a year ago. If you haven't already, I highly suggest you also watch part 1. Have a great day, and if you enjoyed this video, please remember to hit the like button.